Wonderful. Yeah, well, bismillah. And uh, I'm going to just introduce Miles and we're, we'll have a, a little bit of back and forth. Um, and then we'll, we'll really open it up to the audience. I think uh, a lot of people are, are um, uh, really tuning in to hear Pierre Netanel, Miles Yepes, uh, and uh, his thoughts and, and ideas and um, just really way of being and embodiment. And I've had the, the pleasure of having an immersion over the last few days of uh, some of the, his thinking and writing and uh, it's really warmed my heart. Um, and I, I also come from a, a, a Sufi tradition and uh, uh, I was saying to Pierre uh, Natanel that, uh, you know, we, we come from a, uh, what's considered a heretical Sufi tradition. And, and he said this beautiful line, oh, every Sufi is a heretic to somebody. So, uh, yeah, so it'll, I guess, be a conversation among, uh, among heretics and, as, as uh, Bio said earlier, uh, among fugitives. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll do a, a, a quick intro and then, and then we open up. So, so uh, Pierre Nathaniel Miles Yepes is uh, the current head of the Inayati Maimuni Order of Sufism. Uh, he's an artist, a writer, a philosopher, a scholar of comparative religion. Um, he first studied history of religion at uh, Michigan State University and then went on to study contemplative religion at Naropa Institute uh, before pursuing traditional studies and training in both Sufism and Hasidism uh, with his peer and, and Rabbi Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, uh, who is a famous pioneer in the interfaith dialogue and comparative mysticism. Pierre Natanel is the author of uh, a forthcoming book. I think it's out now in 2020, The Tea House of Experience, Nine Talks on the Path of Sufism. Uh, he's the translator of My Love Stands Behind a Wall, uh, a translation of the Song of Songs and other poems. He's the co-author of A Heart of a F Heart of Fire, Stories and Teachings of the Early Hasidic Masters, and the editor of various works on interspirituality and interfaith dialogue. He currently lives in Boulder, Colorado where he's a professor in the Department of Religious Studies at Naropa University. Um, and that's where he, he leads the Inayati Maimuni order. Um, and just reading your, your bio and uh, hearing some of your, your, your uh, teachings, you know, the first thing that, that comes is this, this bridge between um, two seemingly disparate paths with Hasidism and uh, Sufism. And maybe that's the, the place to start. Um, and, related with the theme of, of this uh, gathering over the, the, the next five days is, is, is the role of death and uh, almost as a uniting force in some ways between these two paths. So maybe you could just talk a bit about, about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's not that unusual today to see any one of us connected to multiple traditions. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I think there, there's a certain group of people that like to characterize what's happening with religious phenomena today as a kind of uh, pick and choose sort of spirituality. And there's a certain kind of truth to that um, because any one of us could walk into a Barnes and Noble and go to a religion section and, and find the world's religions represented there and not just, um, not just a book of the religion, but maybe uh, uh, specific tantric texts translated right there, you know, things that are considered, been considered the secrets for, for generations. And we have access to all of them. And, and there's a kind of criticism of religion today and the spiritual but, but not religious of just kind of picking and choosing what they like best. And, and there's a truth to that. On the other hand, it, it is also a fact that, that our world is getting smaller and we're standing next to one another in ways we never were before, or which at least didn't happen very often. And that's an organic process. That's a process of the planet, you know, moving elements together and, and seeing what reacts. And, you know, as we know from, from ecology, that the planet likes diversity. And it does like to 
uh, challenge the status quo and bring things together in a very natural way and see what new growth comes from them. You know, what, what uh, you know, in, in Ken Wilber's language, you know, what transcends and includes, you know, what the new form includes the old forms. And that's a, a long way of saying that um, I came by this, this fusion of Hasidism from the Jewish tradition, this esoteric tradition from the Jewish tradition, uh, and, and the Sufism, which is, you know, usually considered an esoteric tradition of Islam, very naturally. The two came together very naturally for me. In fact, I didn't choose uh, either of them. Um, I was actually uh, brought up a Christian. Um, and, but being from a Mexican family, at a certain point, I discovered that my family were what were called crypto Jews. Those Jews who had been forced to convert in Spain during the Inquisition. And so fairly late at 17 years old, I discovered myself, a, you know, a, a Jew. Uh, and it was something uh, with which I felt deeply resonant. And that began an exploration for me. So it's not as if I chose it, I found it. I found myself in it. And then it was uh, my Jewish teacher, uh, a very famous teacher, Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi, uh, founder of the Jewish Renewal Movement and a pioneer in interfaith dialogue, who then actually asked me to become a Sufi initiate. So my master, as it were, already asked me to do that. And so, so I think, you know, this, this kind of fusion is um, more and more possible and more and more necessary, and yet it brings with it issues. Um, how do we, how can we fulfill the necessary requirements of a path, even one path well? And if you add two together, how do you do both well without making either anemic? And so it's, so it's a challenge, but it's a challenge of our time. And I think it's, you know, I do think it's an organic process. And so uh, one that, um, you know, when the planet asks us, I have to trust then that, that it is possible to, to live this reality and to live it well, even if not lived well by the definitions of those who came before us. So, you yeah, know, that's... Well. That's how I came into this. And, Not and easy then, to answer that question simply, no, sorry. No, no, and simplicity is overrated. Um, and what about death, the, the, the overlaps in both Hasidism and, and Sufism? What, what have you learned through your, your scholarship and contemplation? Well, uh, in some ways, that's a simple question, you know, um, that Death drives a lot of the spiritual process. Just the question of death, the fact of death, the confrontation with death uh, invites us into a contemplation. And that contemplation often unfolds onto what becomes the spiritual path in any given tradition um, and becomes a central question that is wrestled with in those traditions. Um, in Sufism, it becomes almost uh, a question right at the heart of the tradition. So as you know, you know, you know, being from a Sufi family yourself, one of the um, great phrases that we repeat to ourselves as Sufis is, you know, mutu kabla antu mutu, die before death, die before death. And which is, which is a, um, a kind of mandate that you find, um, you know, throughout our traditions, you know, in the Catholic tradition, they'd say, memento mori, remember death. And it wants to bring us into good relationship, you know, with what is actually a part of the life cycle. Um, um, prior to being surprised by it. Why anybody is ever surprised by death, one wonders. It seems rather ridiculous, but we also have this ridiculous capacity 
to ignore the basic fact of our existence and to ignore it up until the last moment. Um, you know, but as you know, good people like John Halifax like to point out, it is just a part of the life cycle. Uh, it is what we live with every day and could transform our experience of the every day if we would live with it as such. And so that's what Mutu Kabla Anta Mutu, you know, die before death is inviting us to do. Come into good relationship with what is going to happen so that then we, we then live um, life as we should live it. Uh, I'll, I'll break there and we can say more. Yeah, and you know, I don't uh, know that much about Hasidism. Um, I, I was married into a, into a Jewish family. My, my ex-wife is Jewish and, um, and, and I know there's lots of overlap, uh, uh, especially in the esoteric dimensions, but in, in Sufism, the idea of fana, you know, the uh, idea of annihilation of self as in some ways the, the, the sole spiritual quest in returning home to Allah. Um, what's the overlap in, in Hasidism? Is there a similar sort of drive? And, and you know, I, I look at, for example, in my, in my tradition, there was a lot of use of psychedelics. Uh, you know, we, we, we were called the Hashasin at one point and worked with Hashish and Syrian Rue and, and, and other uh, plant medicines to get to these states, but lots of ways there, whirling, dance, song, trance, yoga, tantra, etc. Um, what are the pathways to, to fana in the other traditions? So the terminology is similar across both traditions, uh, you know, in Sufism, fana, you know, an annihilation of existence, basically. And, and there we have the pairing of fana and baka. Fana uh, annihilating, and the language is kind of harsh, but, uh, but it is an annihilation of the ego. I think today I would call it making the ego transparent, increasingly transparent to the transcendent. You know, so if you, if you, you, treat, you treat it as um, a window that is obscured by, you know, in, you know the, the grime and the oppressions of years, and you wipe that clean, then something just passes through. And I think that that's actually the goal, not the annihilation of the ego, but to make it transparent. And when it's transparent to the transcendent, then the, the sunlight of, of pure existence, as it were, shines through and is completely apparent. And that's what we might call an ecstasis you know, an ecstasy, where you stand outside. Ecstasis means to stand outside, of course. And we stand outside of the limited self for a moment and have an awareness of, of this grand fulfillment, this, uh, this uh, allness of, be of being, this pleroma. Um, but then, as you know, a good friend of mine said, um, um, that's in some ways that kind of mystical experience is like is like going to one of those uh, great stores. We have a store in Boulder, independently owned, where you can get literally everything. You know, garden supplies, groceries. You know, every tool you could want. It's called McGuckins. It's a wonderful store, and. And my friend who was a visitor from Israel came here and he was just astounded by this store. And then one week I was at a teaching he was giving and he said, a mystical experience is a lot like a trip to McGuckin's. You can get anything that you need there, but you can't use it there. If you're going to get a saw, you know, to, you know, to make, to do a work project, you're not going to do your project at McGuckin's. It's, it's, a place we go to to bring back tools to use in this world. And so if that, if that experience of the sun passing through the window of consciousness is going to be of value, um, it has to be 
uh, utilized in this existence. All of that is to say, that's why we talk about fana, which is that experience, and then talk about baka. And baka means subsistence. Uh, and it's that part of the ecstatic experience which we hold in consciousness, uh, which becomes resident in, in waking consciousness in this life, and then it becomes useful for how we deal with one another. So, you know, if I experience the allness of being in its, in its infinite connection, and then come back and I'm a jerk to you, you know, then somehow there wasn't enough baka. <laughs> And enough didn't subsist in me to then draw the right conclusions about behavior. Because our ecstatic experiences have implications for behavior. And if we're not changing the way we act based on them, then there's something out of alignment. It's, it's basically the same teaching in Hasidism, except, you know, we switch the terms to now instead of fana in the Hebrew, it becomes bitul. Uh, in fact, it's bitul uh, hayesh. Again, the kind of um, annihilation of being or existence again. Um, but bitul means something a little more like barrenness. It's also the word for, um, you know, when, when a woman can't conceive, uh, she's barren. You see this word barren in the Bible. And, it, and it's though in some ways it suggests an emptiness, an emptiness of existence. So bitul hayesh is to have that experience. And um, there it's seen in some ways like a, a hollowing out of one's being. You know, we we're these concatenated beings with all these uh, experiences. And in some ways, um, you know, we get lost in them. And so we're cleaned out in that kind of experience. And then we become a vessel that can choose what it lets back in, you know? Mm, so beautiful, some, beautiful. some, some subtleties, uh, indifference, but basically they're both embracing a similar process. Mm -hmm. Um, two other lines of thought I would just love uh, some of your articulation around. Uh, one, one is around uh, the, er, the erotic in intimacy, uh, and the other is, will be around capitalism. And then we're going to open it up to, to the audience, and, and, and maybe people can start putting questions in that I'll, that I'll uh, synthesize for you. But um, first we start with, with intimacy. Um, I, I think of uh, Hazrat Rabia's words where, where, uh, in her poem, Die Before you die where she says, uh, ironic, but one of the most intimate acts of our body is death. So beautiful appeared my death, knowing then who I would kiss. I died, I died a thousand times before I died. And we, we see this a lot in Sufism, this, the, the, the longing of the beloved and the, the, the act of intimacy, but also death as intimacy. Death is coming close, closer to the divine. Um, and maybe you could just say a bit about, you know, that the relationship between, I guess, in, in, in the Greek tradition it would be eros and thanatos. Mm -hmm. Well, well, this, this connects to, you know, you know, that phrase again, mutu kablan to mutu, you know, die before death. And then the question, well, how do you go about doing that on a daily basis? And one of the primary metaphors of Sufism is of there are a number of them, you know, Sufis uh, use the cooking metaphor, you know, the, that we are cooked over time to become palatable, you know. Um, there's the metaphor of, of travel, the saluk, the journey. Um, but the primary metaphor that's used in Sufism is of romantic love. And we know this so well from Rumi's poetry. Um, and within Sufism, it's sometimes said that there's a path of knowledge and there's a path of love. Um, I'm fairly fixed on, on, on the path of love. It's, it's kind of the keynote of a lot of my teachings. And we call that the Mazabi Eshk, um, the, the, school, the school of love. 
And in the School of Love, we talk about um, three specific deaths into love, which remove the ego. They're ego deaths, really. And, and these, this can happen through any given love relationship whether it's with a friend, one's children, you know, a lover. And the first death that we have the challenge of experiencing uh, is the death of the world. And the death of the world is like, um, say I enter into a relationship that whether whether it's my friends or society, someone disapproves. And up until very recently, and still today in many parts of the world, um, there are social sanctions for being with someone with whom you are, you know your greater communal unit or society disapproves. Uh, if we go back fifty years, it, it could mean loss of place in society, loss of work. You couldn't live in a certain neighborhood. No one would sell to you. You know, we know these things, you know, it's within our lifetime of experience for many of us. And, you know, um, including me, my, my parents were in interracial marriage, um, you know, in a time where it wasn't so acceptable. And I thought about this not so long ago, like, oh, there's something for which I didn't give my Anglo father credit that, you know, in the early 1960s, he was willing to marry a very brown Mexican woman. And all these years, I hadn't really credited him with bravery for that. But it was an act of bravery. And it meant that his own mother wore black to the wedding, you know, <laughs> and disapproved, you know. Um, and it could have been worse. But that very act, to do that in the face of opposition, even willing to take the consequences is the death of the world. You know, we'll die to uh, worldly approbation in order to have the love of the person that is beloved. And, and so what the Sufi tradition wants to say is that uh, we need a sufficient motivator to yield ego. Uh, because we have good reason to hold on to ego. Uh, you know, ego does us a service. And we don't talk enough about this today. You know, um, ego in a basic way is what puts food in your mouth, which puts, you know, a roof over your heads and prioritizes those things. And we want it to do that. If our ego wasn't functioning to do that, we'd all be in a pretty bad state. Where we have trouble is that when, you know, as my teacher put it, you know, he, he said the ego is a good manager, but when it thinks it's the boss, you know, everything goes awry. And so it starts to reify itself and strengthen its own kind of power hold. But, you know, where we can be grat grateful to it is it does prioritize making sure those things happen. So since it's in a basic way, a good, an ego is a good, um, we need actually legitimate and strong reasons to undermine it. You know, it's kind of stranglehold on power that it acquires over time. And what Sufis noticed, you know, especially, uh, you know, uh, Rabia of Basra, who you've already mentioned, um, it's around her that the whole Sufi tradition, the orientation changes from one of asceticism to one of of passionate love. And, and what, what they began to notice is that, oh, people yield ego for love. For love of a child, for love of a beloved, they'll give things up. Oh, we'll make that the center of our tradition. The technology of using love to uh, yield more and more ego space over time. And the first challenge we're given is to give up worldly approbation. But then one of the great teachers of the Sufi tradition says, but that's only the first death into love. The second death into love is death of the self. 
in the death of the world, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give up, you know, this kind of work. I'll give up my parents being unhappy with me because I, I get her or him. I get them. They're in my life. I want that more than I want that approbation. But I'm getting what I want. So there's still a strong I present. I have yielded ego space, but not what I want. I just wanted them more than I wanted that job or that situation or that life. The death of the self is what often happens in actual relationship. And anybody that's ever been in a long-term relationship and you don't even have to be in that long <laughs> before you're presented with the need to yield self. And it comes regularly. Um, I was married for 25 years. You know, it, I know it just comes in a regular pattern and it's never easy. And it often looks something like this. I like to use the example, you know, um, this will be part biographical and, and part not, but um, uh, I was engaged when I was 17 and married by the time I was 20. And so, you know, we were kind of babies together that then went to college and acquired enormous debts <laughs> through going to college. And, and so for a number of years, we were very poor, you know, and you know, that, that, that kind of couple you see that eats a lot of ramen noodles, <laughs> you know, all the cheap food and gets by. And finally we get out of college and we have enormous debts and, and it's a big deal for us, you know, to even go out to dinner or I remember, you know, most of our trips out were window shopping. I remember a big night when we decided to treat ourselves going to Tower Records to buy a single CD. You know, it's those kind of things and your relationship is actually strengthened through a lot of this. Uh, getting through together, though it's hard. But eventually things get better. We work, we work a lot. We more and more can pay off bills. And I remember a time when it feels like your head is getting above water. You know, your chin may be just up over the edge of it, but you can breathe. And there's a certain kind of gratitude for getting above that, that, that water line. And then pretty soon there's even a little comfort you know, you can buy furniture. <laughs> you don't have to work two or three jobs anymore. And it's usually at a moment like this, and here's where I'll, I'll switch, you know, a little bit to a you know, less personal example. But it wouldn't be uncommon in any relationship for then, say, my wife to come home from work one day, and I look at her and I can just tell there's a weight on her heart. She seems anxious about something, and if of course, I nervously ask because at being a man, I tend to think it's about me. <laughs> what did I do wrong that I don't know what it, you know, what it is? And, and so I'm a little worried, but I want to know what's wrong with her. And I say, you know, honey, what's going on with you? And she deflects and I persist because I think it's important. I say, no, 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 what's, what's going on? And we sit down and then she says maybe something like, I know we're doing well. I know we have a lot of things now and things are feeling better, but I haven't been sharing it, but I've been terribly unhappy at work. And I think I've been thinking about it a lot and I think I really wanna go back to school. And from that second, you know what happens in my head? The wheels start turning, you know, the calculator starts going. I start adding up the numbers and, and if she stops going to work, we both lose income. And when she starts going to school, then we acquire more debt, which means now I have to work twice as hard again. And so all of that starts to spin very fast, right? That's natural. And, and so what's also natural is for me to start coming up with all the reasons it's not a particularly good time for you to do that, right? And, 
And so those are coming up in my mind very fast. And then I think it's a bit of grace if you can take a breath and in a moment, if you allow a little space, you, there might be a voice that whispers in there somewhere. It's not about you. What she's asking is not about you. And here's where I either graduate in relationship or fail. If in that moment I can hold back on all the good reasons for her not to do this, and I can take a breath and I can say, honey, what would you need from me to be able to do that thing that you need to do? In that moment, I graduate. Because, you know, and, and the relationship is then strengthened or weakened if I'm not able to do that. But that, I think, is a very real sort of example that we have, you know, you know on this call, looking at the numbers of people here, um, you know, at least half the people will have this, some variant of this within the week. And if you can do that, that is a very real yielding of the self um, that will lead to tremendous growth. Because what I wanted was more comfort. I liked where we were. But what you come to in a moment like that, if you're able to actually get bring in some breath around it and space around it is like, in the end, I wanted her to be happy more than I wanted this comfort. Uh, not everybody comes to that conclusion. <laughs> However, it's a very important thing. And, and often it's true, even when we don't do it, like, uh, we may fail in that particular moment, but, it, but in the truth, we really do want that person to be more happy than, than I want this luxury. But we don't tend to get there. But that's a yielding of the self. That says, I want what you want more than what I want. And it's still only the second death of the ego. The third death uh, of the uh, ego... So, go ahead. Sorry, before you finish, I want, uh, we all want to hear the third. Uh, I'm just going to ask people to put in questions because we have about seven minutes left. So we'll, ah. we'll finish that and then I'll, I'll synthesize some questions for you. So the, you. the third. So the third death of the ego is in some ways simpler. And this is what uh, Rabia would be talking about most often. And it's called the death of the beloved. And... The death of the beloved represents a number of things. One, you know, one, you know, in the context in which many people enter, you know, uh, you know, a conference on science and non-duality is the non-dual experience itself. The mystical experience in which you lose self, in that experience you also lose the beloved. We spend all this time you know, in longing for union, longing for union in Sufi terms with the beloved, with the divine. But then in the experience of union, in some sense, we lose the divine also. There is only an allness of being. And, and so that's the death of the beloved. But the death of the beloved in terms of relationship is that one way or another, we lose our beloved. It's a world of mortality. Uh, we will all lose the ones that we love, or they will lose us, you know, and which comes first. Um, and we even lose relationships with people that we love, people that, with whom we're still in love, and sometimes the relationship doesn't endure. And what Sufism wants to point out is that uh, that, that is also a graduation that we can, you know, come into the fullness of, or we can fail. The failure of that death of the beloved is at the end of a relationship, whether through mortality or circumstance. If we fall into bitterness and shutting down the emotions and saying, I didn't love them, 
I hate them, you know, whatever. Whatever we te whatever narrative we try to put in place of, of the, the pain that is we're then experiencing, uh, Rumi would say that's a failure of love. And he would say, he said incredible things like, um, uh, love, I've named you pain without remedy. And sometimes he says, seek pain, seek pain, seek pain. Now he's not, he's not suggesting a kind of masochism. What he's suggesting is that leave that channel open. The pain and the grief is a process that will transform you. He says, basically, you were never in relationship to the beloved. You were always in relationship to your love. And you cannot lose the love except by shutting it down yourself. And it's like you may lose the target of your love, but you can still exist in the love. And that's an expansion of being that creates wisdom and maturation and growth. And so that is the, the third ego death. So Beautiful. that's the process. And, and it's very related to the, um, to the question that, that uh, came in from, from Claire in Santa Cruz, which is, okay, these, these three deaths, um, how do they fit into the, the actual death of the world? You know, the, the Anthropocene, the, the end of late stage capitalism, the kind of, you know, wholesale destruction of, of all that is through, through consumption and the Western way of life. <laughs> How do we put this in the context of the sixth great extinction? Well, I think in some ways, uh, classically, a Sufi would then ask, well, uh, if you're going to consider that question from a Sufi perspective, then you would have to consider it related to what is your beloved. Um, if you're going to experience that death one way or another, you know, this kind of, these large scale processes, um, and you're going to be, um, <laughs> I can't find quite the right word, happy with the process is not, is, is not quite the appropriate word, but if you're going to find uh, peace and depth and a rich experience of the process and not be overwhelmed by it, you have to know what the beloved is that you're yielding the world for. And, you know, maybe on this call, it might be uh, the unity of all being. Uh, if, if we're going to experience the unity of all being, the Wadat al-Wujud, um, there are a lot of things that are happening in the process today in the larger world that are um, moving toward that, that realization. Um, Black Lives Matter is a, is a desire being articulated from the planet to embrace the unity of all being. You know, that if you're going to say everything is divine, then, then those places that most need recognition of their divinity are those places which are most rejected. The most rejected parts of ourselves or on a societal level, the most rejected parts of the society. That's where we need to focus most attention. So again, it's not that all lives matter, of course they do. But when we're trying to come into good relationship with the unity of all being, where it matters most to recognize the divinity is where it's most uh, rejected. And so the unity of all being is God uh, in this in this context is the beloved and then we'll face the losses that come to achieve the unity of all being and so we're seeing breakdowns um, and you know my prayer is always you know you know to God you know let the fires burn that need to burn and and I pray in that process that the innocent are protected as much as possible but if they're burning to a good end, you know, then I'm in support of that. And yet I'm just adding this dimension to the prayer. But please protect the innocent. Please protect the innocent, you know, in that process. But I'm, I'm not wanting to stop the process. It needs to happen. 
there are structures that need to burn now. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I feel about that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, beautiful. And it's a beautiful way to end. Um, and, and I think we're at time and I'll ask Carlos and, and the sand team, if, if there's anything else, or if we have a little more space. Um, if you have one more question, no, mm -hmm. this is fine. Let's do one more. Um, if anyone has, yeah, feel free to, to put it in the, in the question box. Um, and, and in the meantime, you know, I'll, maybe I'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, 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 I'd love to hear your perspective on the role of grief because we were sort of leading there with Claire's question about, you know, how, how do you hold this moment of, uh, as you say, the things that need to burn are burning and, uh, yet there is a role for, for some kind of maybe a sacred grief and perhaps a sacred rage um, as a commensurate response to, to the moment. Well, that sacred grief is really what Rumi was talking about when he's, he's talking about the pain without remedy and seeking pain. It means um, befriend your pain. Uh, and it's not a wallowing in it, but it is... Um, grief is often, um, you know, a process we don't necessarily want to be in, but we don't necessarily get much choice about it. And yet we do have some choice about how we relate to it. And often we do try to shut it down, go on too quickly. And, and really, the grief is only a reflection of the love. Uh, I w remember a wonderful example. I heard this a story of a, a mother who had lost her child in a kind of an accident in a pool. And she was grieving so badly, you know, she would go to the cemetery and she would actually beat her head against a stone, you know, the stone. And her friends were so worried about her and they, they even called her therapist and said, you need to medicate her. He says, I can't make her take it. And it won't change. He said, basically, there's nothing wrong with her. She, she's grieving. And, and they said, but she's in danger. And he said, yes, she is in danger. But it's her process. He says, I can't really affect it. And, and that, that same mother said later, I needed to grieve to the degree to which I had loved my child. Mm. And and if that had been interrupted, my grief would not be complete. And that's the thing that we forget, that if we shut down the grief, we shut down the love. Uh, and we, we often don't, we want to watch that process because we can mute all of our emotions by muting one. And so if we have grief about this, we have to realize it's connected to our love. And that's actually very important to remember right now, you know, as we're sad about many different things. Um, we're only sad because we do love. And it's important not to forget that. And also to realize that we still have that love and we can operate from that love. We can act from it. And the grief is only reflecting that the fact that we feel like it's being impacted the things that we love. But our love is, is pure and available and it can be the source of, of action, as I just said. But, but the, if we fall into the grief without realizing what it's connected to, then we can go into a pathological process of grieving. So I, you know, if we're going to be balanced at this particular time, it's very important to realize you're only as sad, at, you know, in terms of its intensity, as you have love. And if you're feeling very sad, it means you're a great lover. Lean into that right now, because that is where there's still an opportunity to do something. Do something loving. So I, I think that I can't say better than that. So mm -hmm. no, it's, it a, it's a beautiful way to end. Yeah, thank you, Pierre Netanel, and for your work and for continuing the work of Inyat Khan in, in the universal transmission of love.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Shukran. Shukran. Mm. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Mm.